Nitya Ashragi. I'm the Director of Clinical Research at Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation. And we have with us here today Dr. Susan Love, the Chief Visionary Officer of our foundation. And we're super excited that everyone has joined us today. We're going to talk about a couple of research studies that have been conducted um, at the foundation in collaboration with some of our partners. Um, today's talk is titled The Unexplored Human Breath. And we're going to be talking about um, a couple of studies that um, you Army of Women members have probably heard about and some of you signed up and participated in, which we really thank you for, um, the Bacterial and Viral Diversity Study and the Mapping the Breast Duct Study. Um, so I'm going to let Dr. Love say hello to everybody today. Hello, I'm here. <laughs> welcome to our, welcome to the broadcast. We're happy to have you. And we're very excited to share back. Um, one of the biggest things that we think is really important in research is to share the results back with the people who actually participated in the studies. Um, so we're hoping some of you who participated in the studies have joined today um, or are listening later on. And uh, thanks to everybody who joined. So we'll go ahead and get started with the slide set. Um, we first wanted to give just a brief introduction um, to the Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation. Um, our mission is um, we are dedicated to achieving a future without breast cancer by engaging the public and the scientific communities in innovative research. And as you can see from the image there, we are at the center. We work with everyone. We don't discriminate, and we want to bring everybody together, um, convene everybody to get, to get the work done. And then, so some of the ways we do this are through enabling, no, enabling novel research on the human breast, um, translating science to engage the public as informed partners, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and this is one of the ways that we do that, by having these webinars. And then performing, facilitating, and inspiring innovative and collaborative research. Next. Um, one of the ways we translate science to engage the public as engaged partners, we have obviously our Army of Women. Um, we're very excited that we have more than 380,000 registrants since 2008. We've had over 98,000 women um, and some men respond to our studies calls to action for 108 studies since the Army of Women launched in 2008. There's been a variety of different studies. Um, and some of our, our goals right now are really focused on increasing participation of underrepresented um, ethnicities in research and engaging more researchers to utilize the Army of Women. Um, we also have our Health of Women study, which hopefully some of you are taking part of. It's our online cohort study. Um, and we're really excited with that project. And it's evolved throughout the years. And we're doing some different work. And, we did a big quality of life questionnaire and got some great data, and that has branched out into additional studies as well. Um, so definitely take a look at our website, and you can learn more about the Health of Women study um, and other opportunities for you to take part. Next. Um, and then we also have um, Research Worth Watching, which is um, blogs that are on our website and in newsletters where we're talking about, uh, Dr. Love talks about different research that's in the news and things that people um, should know about and puts it out there in ways that are easier to understand than some of the science jargon that's out there. Um, and we're also really excited um, to have our inpatient science program. That's also on our website, and you're going to find videos in there that talk about a variety of topics um, in, in relation to breast cancer. And um, people are really excited about it, and we'd love for you to go onto our website and, and check that out as well, because as Dr. Love always says, we are inpatient patients, and we want to see things move forward quicker. Next. Um, and then finally, we also inspire research. Um, this through our, our biennial international symposium on the breast um, in 2015. We awarded 50,000 in pilot grants to four teams, and then we had a single, I'm sorry, three teams, and then we had a single $20,000 award um, to research collaborations that were formed during the symposium. So these people came together, they talked at the symposium, they got together, they came up with ideas, um, and presented them, and, and, and teams were chosen to get these awards. And something that we um, are all, we all also think is very important is including advocates in the process. So each of the teams had um, a clinician, a basic scientist, and an advocate, at least one advocate as well, um, who were also at the conference. And so we're bringing everybody together to get this science moving. Next. 
So, and just an overview of our research philosophy, you know, we want to solve a clinical problem. Um, and then research is multidisciplinary, multi-institutional. So like we were talking about before, we bring people together um, with these projects that we're talking about today. We bring people from different disciplines to come together. They're from different institutions, academic and other types of institutions to come together. And that obviously goes along with our collaborative nature as well. And then with our research, we want to, whenever possible, do it in humans rather than animal models. Next. So I'm going to hand the mic over to Dr. Love, and she's going to give um, some background um, that will set the stage to talk about the two different studies we're going to go over today. So it's great to be here, and welcome to all of you. And we're really excited to tell you some of the results we've had in our in some of our research on the human breast. Um, which one? There we go. One of the things that I think we lose track of uh, um, in science particularly because so much of the research goes on in rats and mice, um, is that the breast in, in women is pretty unique. It doesn't show up until puberty. It's the only organ that doesn't you're not born with. Um, and then um, you it hangs out and waits until maybe gets a little excited when you get your period. But until you get pregnant, um, it doesn't go through its full development. And at which time it turns into a milk factory. And it's capable of turning blood into milk, which is pretty magical in and of itself. It also gives immunity to the baby um, and some of the microbiome. And then um, after menopause, it goes into retirement. Um, so it's, it's a pretty, it's an organ that has a lot of different functions over time, as opposed to, say, your pancreas or your lungs, which just hang out and do the same thing their whole time. And that may be one of the reasons it's one of the more common sites of cancer um, that we see. Um, I shouldn't touch things. Um, most of the research, however, is, is on animals. And animals really are not like women. Big surprise, particularly rats. But rats and, and other animals usually only have one doctor one te one per teat. So, um, and then they have multiple teeth in a line on either side. Um, the breasts only show up for lactation, and then they go back down flat-chested again. They don't have breasts that they're ready all the time like we do. And they don't naturally get breast cancer. The only animals that get breast cancer are domesticated dogs and macaque monkeys. So even the first study that said where breast cancer starts, which is supposed to be at the, where, between the duct and the lobules, was based on a study in rats in 1975. So God knows if that's really true in people. <laughs> And God doesn't talk to me a lot. <laughs> Next. Um, and so we really haven't explored the human breast hardly at all. The, the last person who tried to map the, the amount of ducks in the human breast was Ashley Cooper. And that was in 1839. And there were a lot of women then who were dying in childbirth and after childbirth. And so he had access to um, a lot of breasts that he could dissect. And um, he came up with this somewhat map showing multiple ducks, not um, like the uh, uh, pictures you sometimes see. Um, and we really don't know um, the, anat the full anatomy of the human breast um, system. We don't know what happens, at what happens after uh, puberty. We don't know the microbiome of the breast. And we don't know whether it's the breast that goes bad or the duct that goes bad. We know when you get cancer, it's the duct. But we really don't know very much about it. Next slide. Um, so the traditional picture makes the breast look like a pizza. Um, and it really isn't a pizza. Uh, it makes the traditional picture that you'll see in a lot of books show 15 to 20 openings in ductal systems. And, and they're radially. And all the ducts are the same size. And it's two-dimensional. And of course, that's not true at all. So that's just an artist making it up. Next slide. This one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this one is a little bit uh, uh, more accurate. This was an artist's reconstruction of ducts in a lactating breast after ultrasound. And you can see there's multiple opening ducts that open at the nipple. And then they're very complicated, the ducts, like, much more like branches of a tree. Um, but this is, a, again, an artist's picture. And what we need is a map of what it looks like in real women. So, you can get into the breast. And some of you, um, if you have participated in our research, have had this 
happen, it looks a little bit, um, I can see you all, even through the computer, folding your arms over your breast as we look at these pictures. But nonetheless, um, you can numb up the nipple pretty easily with some Novocaine. And then you can either squirt fluid in. That's called ductal lavage. You can put um, different catheters down the duct. Um, and we've done that um, in, uh, uh, as well in trying to figure out whether the ducts are the same or different. And we found that the ducts don't attach to each other. Each one is independent. So think much more like branches of a tree that don't interact with each other. Each branch is independent. Next slide. Um, our previous research looked at um, could, you know, what was the difference duct to duct between hormones. And we actually showed that the estrogen, progesterone, and protein levels, we looked at them in three ducts um, once and then six months later. And we were able to show that they weren't the same duct to duct. There was no correlation. So, and it's interesting because one duct, um, only one duct gets cancer, not all the ducts. And so there may be something about what's going on in that duct. The other thing that was interesting was that there was no correlation over time. So whatever your levels of hormones were at the time, they changed. And we do know when you breastfeed that if you drink coffee or, 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 or take certain drugs, it's in the breast milk. So the breast really turns blood into milk, which is pretty magical when you think about it. Um, and in the ability to do that, it alters it and changes it over time. And that may have something to do with breast, with breast cancer. We also showed that the inflammatory markers were different duct to duct as well. Next slide. So the unit of study really should be the duct and not the breast. You know, when you get cancer, it's in one duct, not the whole breast, um, that goes bad. And so we should be able to figure out um, where the duct is, and then we should be able to treat the whole duct. Right now, we sort of arbitrarily take out a piece of tissue somewhere in the breast, but we're not thinking about the ductal system. And maybe we could instead, my, my fantasy is we could squirt Drano or something down the duct and clean it out and fix it without even having to do surgery. But right now, we need a map or we need something better to detect where the ducts are in the breast so that when somebody gets a cancer in a duct, we can figure out where to treat. Next. So the first study that we're, we're looking at is the one to look at the microbiome of the breast. And the microbiome um, is, is really um, uh, hot right now, because we have new technology that allows us to be able to measure the bacteria and viruses in the breast in the way that we couldn't do it before. Um, and and I, I just was reminded to tell you, if you have any questions, just write them before you forget. And I'll, get, I'll answer them at the end. But you can ask them at any time. So if you're like me, if you don't ask them now, you'll forget by the end of the talk. So don't hesitate. Next slide. You know, they look, the, the new ways to study the microbiome is that we used to, what we used to do when I was first in practice, is you took a piece of tissue or you took blood or fluid and you put it on a Petri dish. And then you put it in an incubator, and you waited to see what grew. And you had to have everything perfect. You had to have the right things in the Petri dish, the right things to feed it and to support it. You had to have it in the incubator for the exact right amount of time. And so it really was limited in terms of what it was able to show you. Now what we do is we map all the DNA and all the RNA in the body or in the tissue we're looking at. We subtract the human DNA and RNA, and we see who's left. And lo and behold, we found out that there's all kinds of bacteria and viruses that we didn't even know about because we didn't have the conditions right to grow them. And that's why you're seeing all these papers about, oh, the microbiome of this and that and the skin and all kinds of things. It's this new technology. So they did this big project, the Human Microbiome Project, and they mapped different areas of the body in a number of people. And they looked at the mouth and the skin and the, and the colon and the esophagus and the stomach and the vagina, but they skipped the breast. Um, I, you know, I'm not quite sure why they didn't do the breast. Um, I think maybe it's because they're boys, but that's my bias. Next slide. Um, and the breast gets sucked on um, by babies and lovers. Um, and so it's probably got bacteria and viruses in it. Um, and we can see where they, we can test for them 
by looking at nipple aspirate fluid, looking at ductal lavage, looking in the ductal fluid, or even looking in tissue. Next slide. So we looked at nipple aspirate fluid, which is putting a, a little cup on the nipple and then aspirating with a syringe and seeing what fluid you can get out of a duct. So um, it's really the, the, the dripping, literally, um, out, of, um, out of a particular duct. And we did that initially in two volunteers. And we looked, we did the DNA analysis to see if we could, this would even work. Next slide. And indeed, we were able to show um, in one woman and one nipple had all kinds of, in the low NAF field, had all kinds of bugs, bacteria, and viruses in her duct. Um, the, the second person on the, um, on the left of your screen had only staph on one, which probably had to do with potentially some kind of pimple or something nearby with staph in it and then had a variety in the other duct as well. And you can see some of them match up, um, like the propionobacteria, which is a lot in the donor 2. It's those stripes. And then you see the stripes again even in donor 1. So it at least showed that, in, that you could do it and this would work. Next slide. So then we made a bigger study. Um, and, oh, then meanwhile, our, our collaborators at John Wayne Cancer Institute um, studied tissue from their bank, and from their breast bank, they were able to show, and this is tissue now, not fluid, and they looked at cancer side and the normal side, and the tissue that was normal near it. And they were able to show two bacteria that were the most common. Um, one was sphingomonas, which was most common in the normal, and one was radiotolerance, which was most in the tumor tissue, the, and also in the normal. Now, the interesting thing was, the syngomonas was there was none in the, in the tumor tissue. So this started to make us think, could this be a bacteria that might be protective because you found it in the normal but not in the cancer? Dun, dun, dun. And maybe you get some protective bacteria from all that nipple-mouth interaction. So we went on to do another study next, because this wasn't very big. Um, and we are, this is just showing, I'm sorry, this is showing comparing what we found in the John Wayne study, the normal, the tumor side, and then there was a study in Canada of breast tumors. And you can see by the colors that, that there's sort of a, there, there is somewhat of a match um, in the three, which makes you think it might actually be, you know, real. Next slide. So, and you can see that the syngomonas is very high in the normal tissue, um, and then you see in the tumor side very low. Next slide. Um, so, then we decided we were going to do it, we would look in nipple aspirate fluid and see if this bacteria was in the tissue or in the fluid. Because my theory, if, if my theory is right, that the bacteria get into the fluid, because, into your ductal fluid by mouth-nipple interaction, uh, then that means um, it should be in the fluid as opposed to the tissue. So we recruited from the Army of Women 211 women who agreed to have nipple aspirate fluid for this study. Next slide. Um, you couldn't have had cancer or taken antibiotics because we didn't. We, we thought if you'd been on antibiotics, that might change the outcome. We actually didn't want you to be on hormones. We were trying to make it as clean as we could. You couldn't be breastfeeding, have had chemo or therapy or radiation in 12 months, or had any surgery to your nipple or have any infections. All of that obvious. Next slide. So we very carefully, sterilely, like we were in the operating room with hats and gloves and masks and everything, um, we did nipple aspirates for um, 23 women without a history of breast cancer and 23 with a history of breast cancer. And then we had a questionnaire about all kinds of things. And then we did the, did the analysis, that's the MI seq amplicon sequencing. Um, and uh, we ended up with, when we, we had to we had interesting findings. Just shows you why it's research. Because we use betadine, which is an iodine solution, to clean the nipple. And betadine is supposed to be sterile. That's what you use to sterilize things. Okay. But we found out that it actually had dead bugs in it. Because the difference is, in the old days, before this mo new way of looking at, at microbiome, the way we figured out whether there was a bacteria or not was could it grow and would it cause an infection? 
Well, the betadine doesn't have any bacteria that could grow or cause an infection, so we call it sterile. However, it has lots of dead bugs who can't grow or cause an infection. So when you're just analyzing the DNA and RNA of everybody who's there, you find the dead people and the alive ones, the dead bugs and the alive ones. So that made us have to filter out some people. So we got ended up with six healthy subjects and six with a history of cancer. And we found, indeed, there was bacteria. And more excitingly, there was a difference between the women who had cancer and the women who didn't. The nipple aspirin fluid with the women who had cancer was different than that of the people who had never had cancer in their breast. And the types of bacteria were mostly the same, but the amounts were very different. Next slide. And so if you look now on the green side, is the people, the bacteria, and the people who had cancer, had a history of cancer. And the orange side is the bacteria and the people who didn't. Now, these people have no infections, mind you. They're just walking around healthy people. This is normal to have bacteria. There's nothing wrong with them. But what we wanted to see is could we find something different? And indeed, we could. Next slide. Um, and so what's the, could this be true? Well, we know that high antibiotic use increases your risk of breast cancer. So people who take a lot of antibiotics increase the risk. Could that mean because they change the bacteria and viruses in their, in their um, ducts and make them ones that are not protective, but maybe are ones that are more likely to give you cancer? Maybe. Now, remember, this is research, so we really don't know. Um, and then another is um, that nuns and those who have never breastfed have more breast cancer. Now, if the bacteria are getting in the ducts by mouth-nipple interaction, i.e., somebody sucking on your nipple, a lover or a baby, then theoretically, the nuns are not having that happen. And then theoretically, they would have increased rates because they wouldn't have the protective bacteria that comes from nipple-mouth interaction. Now, I just made all that up, so don't get too carried away. But it is possible that this is true. And it may be one of the explanations. Next slide. Um, so what does this mean? It means that their existence of bacteria in the breast tissue, they had seen that before. But we were the first to show it in the ductal fluid. And it shows that there might be, where do they come from, and what does it mean? And it, we need more study. And we put in a big a grant to the NIH to see if we can do more study. Um, and we're trying to get funding to do a, a bigger study that will actually look and maybe look at the people who have BCIS or breast cancer when it's just in the duct and see if that, if, if that makes a difference. And do you see the bacteria that's protective or not? So this is very early work. This is um, you know, work that's exploratory to see what we can study further, but very exciting. And you wouldn't be able to do it uh, without, without you. You want me to answer these questions now? Um, we have a couple. OK, we can answer these before we go to the next one. Let's see, while we're still on it. Are my saying alone is under mastectomy? There's no analysis. Uh, that, yes. Well, what happens is the ductal system, the ducts, this is Deborah Frank's question. The ducts are, are threading through the tissue, right? So you have the, the um, uh, you have the breast tissue, and then you have the ducts threading through it. And so they're looking at whatever is, uh, is in that little piece of tissue that they're looking at. Can breast cancer starts in the duct. So if there's a cancer, they, they are seeing that. The lobules are, the, are the, at the end of the duct. They're like the leaves on a tree. So if you think about the duct as a branch of a tree and the duct and the lobules as the leaves. So they're looking at whatever is in that little piece of tissue they're looking at under the microscope. But they're not looking at the bigger picture. And they actually don't know. They don't have a map of the duct. So they wouldn't know where else to look in the breast. So they don't know where the duct is. Um, and we'll get to why we want to map the, the duct in a minute. Um, uh, am I looking at HPV status? Uh, with, that hasn't been looked at, but it's a good question by Susan Green. And is there a genus name for, for M radio tolerance? I'm sure there is, but I'll have to look it up. So we'll have to get back to you on that one, Susan. Um, uh, because the, the analysis was done 
both at John, uh, for this was done at John Wayne and also at the Jet Propulsion Lab. We told you in the beginning that we tend to we use whoever has the expertise. So it turns out that the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena has a Department of Planetary Protection so that we don't take bacteria and viruses to Mars and Venus. And so they're really good at detecting small numbers of bacteria and viruses, and they helped us um, do the, uh, the analysis of all the bacteria and viruses DNA in the duct. So it just shows you we will work with whoever has the expertise, and they're at doing that. They're a little nervous when you say breath too much in a sentence, but they're really good at doing the analysis of bacteria and virus. Next slide. And then our, our last question that we have here from um, Deborah is, what about those? Yeah, I, I, I thought I answered that. I said lobular, lob, the lobules are connected to the ducts, and so any bacteria or virus that's in the ducts are also in the lobules. All right, perfect. And if you have any more questions, just, just keep them coming. To and, yeah. and we'll move along to the next one, and then we'll. But I'll answer whatever you have. Next question. Next slide. So the next thing that our next prelim, um, exploratory study is mapping the ducts, and it goes along with what we we were just talking about that we don't have a good map of the ducts or the lobules, and so we don't have something that can show surgeons where to go. Next slide. So breast cancer, we think the the, the theory is it starts in the duct and or the lobule, it slowly grows within the duct of the lobule, the lobule's at the end of each duct, and um, that the when it gets finally big enough or aggressive enough or excited enough, it breaks out of the duct into the surrounding tissue. So when it's stuck in the ducts, it's called in situ, and when it gets out of the duct, it's called invasive. So invasive doesn't mean invaded your whole body, it actually means invaded outside of the duct or lobule. So as opposed to non-invasive. Next slide. And the way we do it now is we find these little microcalcifications because when the disease is in the duct, sometimes it doesn't have enough blood supply and some of the cancer, some of the cells die off because they don't have enough blood supply in, inside the duct since there's no blood vessels within the duct, and they calcify. And so on a mammogram, you can see them as these little tiny calcifications, and if you look within that, that circle, you might see a few dots um, uh, that are very, very small white dots. Um, those are the calcifications. And those calcifications say there might be some kind of DCIS or some kind of cancer there. And so as a result of that, we um, put a wire in where the calcifications are taken right around that area and look and see. Um, but it's blindly done. You can't, when you're operating, you can't see it or feel it. You're just taking out the tissue at the end of the wire, and the wire may or may not be exactly where the calcifications are. And then you make all kinds of slides. You, you know, you, you take the tissue and you dehydrate it, and then you slice it on a thing that's like a meat slicer, and you make very thin slices, and then you put it on a slide, and then you get rid of the, the, um, the wax, and then you look at it under the microscope. So you're not looking at all the tissue by any means. You're looking at just a small sample of the tissue. Um, and you may or may not um, have an area, you know, you, you look at the edges to see if it's at the margins, but you, may, you don't look at all the edges. To look at all the edges would be about 3,000 slides, and we make maybe three or four. So um, the chance of missing something is enormous. And if we had a map of where the duct was, we would actually know where to cut, and we would actually be able to tell whether we got it all or not. Next slide. So some people have shown that you can see the ducts. Um, this is uh, the top one is an ultrasound, and you can see that um, uh, with saline down the ducts, this is one we did, you can see a duct, and you can see the branches of the duct, and then saline is salt water. And then you also, this is Ramsey did a, a, um, a 3D ultrasound of a lactating woman. And you can see in the corner where that the black mark is, which is where they were focused, you see those, um, those uh, holes like Swiss cheese. Those are ducts. So, and then you can see where the arrows are also. You can see some other ducts. So you can see ducts normally if you have something in them. Otherwise, they're collapsed and you don't see them. So you need to have 
fluid in them to, to be able to see them on a mammogram or an MRI or an ultrasound or anything. They're just, otherwise they're, you won't be able to see them. Next slide. So I had this idea. I've been wanting to map them forever. And I thought, you know, now that there's 3D ultrasound and seeing that one picture that I just showed you that someone else did, maybe we could do 3D ultrasounds of women who had milk in their gut. And when you're breastfeeding, your ducts are filled with milk, then maybe we could see that we wouldn't have to squirt anything in or inject them. We, an ultrasound is safe. And we could do that, and we could see where the ducts are. Next slide. So we recruited lactating women by the Army of Women. And we, we so far, and the, I, we, we weren't sure whether it was better to do them with their breast full or empty or in between. Um, and so we, didn't, we had to sort of work with our, with our uh, partners to figure that out. Next slide. And we, again, um, because the images are really complicated, we called in our friends at the Jet Propulsion Lab because they're really good at clouded images, sort of like from Venus and Mars. And we just told them, you know, these are sort of like rivers, and they're <laughs> they're in this mountain, and map them. So they were helping us. Um, we 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 our initial study, we did six women because this is really preliminary work. We didn't really know whether it would work or not, and we we didn't know exactly how to analyze it. Next slide. And we had a questionnaire, and we did whole breast 3D ultrasound in both breasts, both full and empty. So we said, bring your baby, come full, and then breastfeed, and then we'll do it again. And I got to play with the babies, which was the most fun. Um, and, <laughs> and we collected the images. Next slide. Um, and this is the 3D, how the 3D ultrasound is done. And these are our six for people and their ages and how many babies they've had and how old their baby was. So we had a variety of ages um, uh, of an amount of time that they breastfed. Now, notice the way it's done. It's 3D, but they're still squishing your breast and you're laying on your back, which means that the milk is going to head backwards. So you're less likely to see milk under, under the nipple. Next slide. So we showed that you could get the images. That was good. And we showed that, the, and the interesting thing was, this was the most interesting thing of the whole thing, that even though the women were allegedly full, they, remember they were on their backs and they were squished, that it wasn't, you didn't see all the ducts. In fact, the, the majority of the ducts were in the lower part of the breast, and only the woman who had been breastfeeding the longest had ducts in the upper part of the breast. Now, this is really interesting, because the assumption has always been that all your ducts are making milk at the same time. So they all should have milk in them. And, and that if you have twins, or if your baby's older, you'll just make more milk. But it, we always thought they were all producing. But in this very preliminary work, it looks like maybe not. Maybe they're not all producing. Maybe it is, it starts out in the lower outer part, which actually Ashley Cooper, the guy who did the, the way back in the 1800s, um, said that was so the baby's head would lean on the ducks and squirt the milk out. <laughs> who knows? But at any rate, the most of them were the lower outer, and that it was only in the women who were breastfeeding the longest. Now. Breast cancer is most common in the upper outer. And at least from these six women, and, and I am getting out on a limb on this because you really can't make, you can't make conclusions based on six women. But I can make up a, a good story. And the story would be that the last duct to be used is the upper outer, and that that may be why most cancers are, in fact, in the upper outer. Because maybe the ducts that you don't use for breastfeeding are the ones that get cancer, and the ones that are used for breastfeeding are less likely to get cancer. Because at the end of breastfeeding, you have massive involution. The duct is cleaned up, and then you make new ducts for the next kid. But maybe if you don't use it, you don't clean it up. So then you acquire mutations, and so maybe the ones that don't. And we know people who haven't breastfed at all have more breast cancer than people who have breastfed. So it's you know, preliminary data, um, it's interesting, fewer ducts were observed on the right than the left, but, you know, 
this is six women. So you've got to be careful about getting too carried away. Um, and significant inner, you know, there's, there, there may be um, a, a lot of variability. We tried, we've done some, some, we did two women, three women, in Northern California where you lay on your stomach in a different kind of machine to see if that's different. And that analysis we don't have fully yet. And so what we really, you know, need to do is a lot more. Um, so a question is, could it be because the way we hold our babies against our chest that they're only suckling in that area? Yeah, it could be, but if all the ducks were making milk, then wouldn't you expect, even though you were sucking there, that the others would have some milk in them? So you, you could be, but, and there is a study, interesting, in China, outside of China, on an island, where uh, they only breastfeed from one breast. I'm not sure why. I don't know whether it's cultural or whether it's so they can, you know, cook with the other breast side or what. But they only suck. They only breastfeed on one side, and all their cancers are on the other side. And we do know women who never breastfeed have more cancers than women who do. So it, it's it's intriguing. We obviously need to do a lot more, and we're trying to get the the funding to do that uh, right now. That's fine. Um, this is a picture just to show you. Um, the arrows are pointing to, to ducks, um, and you can see them, but you don't see. Um, uh, it's a milk-filled duck in the lower outer quadrant, um, and then you can see similar here and on the left side, just so you can see what it looks like. Next slide. Um, and then this is how they then, what they do is they, they try to mark them so that they can outline them. And then when they do enough people, then they you know, put it in the computer and have it try to figure it out. This is, this is really tedious work, um, in fact. Next slide. Uh, so the conclusion is you can, you can do it. I mean, we can see the ductal pattern in lactating women. Um, and count, counter to common wisdom, not all the ducts are active during lactation, at least in our six women. And the activity was not uniformly distributed, suggesting that additional ductal systems may be recruited as demand increases. And that the ducts are more transporters than reservoirs. So in other words, they're not just hanging out with milk. They just are transporting the milk when you need it. New technology should be applied to these fundamental questions of duct anatomy and lactational physiology to better inform our blah, 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 um, so we can figure it out. Now, we, are, we have the our introductory symposium in February, and there is a group from Australia that has done some lactating women, so we've invited them, and we're going to challenge you know, more people, and we're trying to get some funding to do more women so that we can actually try to figure this out. Next slide. So what's next? We want to study 250 lactating women. Of course, we need the money. And develop a map of the common distribution. And then study the women with DCIS with 3D ultrasound and see if we can show, you know, once we say, okay, this is what, with 20, 250 women, we should be able to say, this is the pattern of dust. And then we can say, and DCIS, you know, is within this duct or that duct so that then you could help map preoperatively for surgery. Next slide. So questions, let's see, we hold our babies. Could gravity pay a role in visible in the lower breast? Yes. Um, however, it could in both ways. You mean when we're walking around? Yes. But then wouldn't you expect the lower inner as well as the lower outer to have, um, if it was just gravity? And then are the ducts under more um, hydro pressure at the time and thus they become a little larger? Uh, yeah, but again, that goes with why was it just outer and not inner? Um, so I'm not sure about that. And the other you got to remember it is when they're laying on their back for this ultrasound, does the milk sort of fall back, and that's why. But then you'd still think you'd see it maybe in the upper outer. So this is still, you know, the thing about science, we have a plaque here at the foundation that says if we knew what we were doing, we wouldn't call it research. And indeed, if we knew what the answer was, we wouldn't call it research. But it's, it's really interesting that we're exploring something. How long have women been breastfeeding over the you know, centuries? And believe it or not, we don't have a map of where the, you know, the holes are in the nipple and where the breast ducts are. And we don't know whether all the ducts are being used or some. 
it's pretty miraculous and amazing that when you think about it. Um, and we really need to uh, we need to figure this out because if breast cancer starts in the milk ducts, then a map would be great. And, and you know, my hypothesis is then if you saw something abnormal, you could maybe squirt something down the duct and fix it. Drano or not really Drano, but you know, something down the duct and clean it out and not have to try to operate and cut out the DCIs, which we have trouble with now. And it is the same as practicing medicine. I don't know who, who gave that question, but it's exactly, exactly the same. Um, uh, specifically curious about CMV positive with negative breast cancer and, and HIV. Um, we did not check specifically about, because um, these were our pilot studies, about um, CMV and HIV, but we definitely should, will have to do that in our microbiome study going forward um, uh, as we, you know, a, as we uh, uh, do it, because I think that's, that's um, and lot, when I say they all start in the ducts, I am considering lobular, because the lobules and the ducts are all connected. The lobules are sort of like the leaves at the end of the tree, but the lobules lead right into the duct, and so it's one, it's connected to each other, and very, sometimes you get lobular cancer, sometimes you get ductal, or sometimes you get both, um, lobule and ductal. So, so when I say duct, I mean the ductal system, can, which includes the lob lobules. Uh, it's being put on one duct tree. Uh, lobules as being one duct tree, yeah, I am. That's exactly right. And so it does have a major implication for ductal decisions. And what would be very interesting, um, because Welling, in his mice and rat studies, said that breast cancer starts at the junction of the duct and the lobule. And um, we don't, you know, we've accepted that as dogma ever since, although we haven't really tested it. And it would be very interesting, is the problem a sick ductal system, which includes all the lobules, in which case you would need to cut out a, a bigger area than we normally do for lobular, um, and, uh, or is it that it's, you know, one branch of the ductal system that's sick, you know, and, and um, those things, until we have a map, until we actually have the anatomy that we can overlay over the disease, we're not going to be able to answer. But there, there are studies, um, there's a good study out of the Netherlands where they, they actually did large sections of breast cancer and they, you know, they mapped them and all, of, all the disease was contiguous. So the idea that things are multifocal, i.e. all over the breast, is not true. They're all within probably one ductal system. So this guy thought it was a sick duct. But we really don't have enough, our ductal system, we don't have enough data yet um, to say that for sure. But it's a good question um, in terms of the lobule. Uh, and let's see, is the other blah, 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 being part of the ductus? So yeah, that's it. They, and it is a, and that's Sus, Susan Breen's question, but also Kim Evans are both um, questioning about that. And I think, you know, it's, a, it's an important question. And we, you know, as long as we keep doing things in, in rats and mice, we're not going to know. Because they have one duct per teeth and one lobule at the end of the duct. So you can't really tell whether um, all the lobules are bad or, or the whole ductal system is bad um, or not. So more research on people. And, you know, we have to do the research. And no, we do the research that nobody else will do because um, it's not uh, it's hard. Um, it's much harder. It's much easier to, to do research on rats and mice. They they are cheap. They do whatever you say. <laughs> they're not hard to recruit, um, and it's okay if they die. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't. But people, it's harder. But that that should not be the barrier. So we're we're going to do it, and we will figure this out. Right now, we're back to trying to figure out grants and funding to do the next step. But we're very grateful to all of you for participating and, and being interested. And we will continue to keep you abreast. Because we can end breast cancer if we all work together and we use our imagination and we really try to you know, think creatively. So more que we're always open for more questions. If anybody else has questions, um, we're excited to have you part of us. 
and um, we hope you continue. We continue on. We'll continue to to keep you, let you know what we find and how we figure this out. Okay. Well, um, so um, just Thank you. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say it doesn't seem like we have any additional questions now. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. All right. So we're going to be posting this webinar on our website, um, and so you can always go there and watch it again and let us know if you have any additional questions. Um, there will be contact information on there as well. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, and, Dr. Love, for a great presentation. And, and also. Let us know if you have any ideas. When you're thinking about this later, if you come up with a good idea, let me know because you, you know, ideas come from all different kinds of places. So the more you think about this, if you come up with an idea, let me know. Mm -hmm. Exactly. OK. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.